new episode now in today's interview we have sean conlon sean is the owner and founder of we make footballers a private football academy based in the united kingdom sean talks about his journey on how he started his academy which is now one of the the biggest private football academies in the whole of the uk so sean shares with us his story about how he started how we found a mentor, how we grew and scaled, and how he turned his centers into a franchise model, which has grown and scaled his business to the next level. Hope you enjoy this video. And if you haven't yet, like, subscribe to stay up to date with all the latest content. In terms of like what we make footballers does for the end customer, and um, we coach children who are aged four to twelve, coaching them fundamentals, often introducing players to the game, coaching players of all different levels, and a high level of like technical detail, working a lot through like the four corners, but I'd say a lot more on terms of the the physical corner and the technical corner and um, it would supplement what players do with the rest of their program with their grassroots teams and maybe a one-to-one coach and the stuff they do on the outside maybe with parents so that's what we make footballers does we we have 60 franchise territories around the world we have around 250 venues. We work with 20,000 players. Um, we have, it's like 500 coaches working with us. Um, and so, yeah, and across across the UK, uh, uh, Dubai and Miami. And so, th- so that's what We Make Footballers does. And um, in terms of how I got into it, Back in 2007, 2008, I was, well, before that, like probably must have been like 2003, 2004, I was like 15 years old. I was volunteering at my local like grassroots club and there was a guy there who scouted for Chelsea and I was like, yeah, volunteering with him. He ran a big soccer school and he used it to get players signed to Chelsea and then I then started volunteering, running a grassroots team for him and little like under sevens team. Did that for a good period of time, then ended up from enough volunteering. It turned out there was a guy who lived on my road who was the youth development officer at Chelsea Academy. He was friends with one of the parents of a kid that I was coaching and they liked the way I coached brought me in to start helping him at Chelsea Academy. In that session, I think there was like Dominic Solanke in that session, maybe Tammy Abraham, if my memory's right. And so like very from the very start, I was like 17 years old, like thrown into, yeah, being involved with Chelsea, having just only ever been at grassroots before that. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, kind of like from just pursuing that, you know, just every day working hard, um, yeah, trying to be better. Um, yeah, there was a whole like journey that happened with take like rebuilding that grassroots club because the guy who initially I was volunteering from left and took away all the teams. I then restarted it. Then when I did a good job there, another club asked me to do it. So then I started doing it a lot for for clubs around London. And then this was in two thousand and eight around that sort of time. And then kept doing it. Started working with footballers' children like. Maluda was bringing his kids to us, Jamie Redknapp, Drogba, Fabregas. Like, so then, yeah, it, it became like very strong in London. Mm-hmm. And then in 2015, I got some mentorship and someone came in and said, oh, look, you know, I think we should restructure how you're doing this and I think you should franchise it. So in 2015, began franchising. And now, yeah, we are where we are. Fantastic. So for those that don't know you too well, you are a you you're a scout as well, right? Is that correct? 
Yeah, so part time, I actually still scout with Chelsea now. Yeah. Mm. So how how do you manage running a, a a massive business plus scouting? Chelsea have been really really good. Um, I think it was around two thousand twenty one. I had a conversation with them, and I said to them like. I'm struggling to still keep being out, going to grassroots games and doing scouting in the kind of like conventional way. But like these are my results. I've been getting like very, very good results for Chelsea Academy and they trusted me. They said, all right, we'll give it a go. Like you can do it your way, like without having to scout at games, but just through we meet footballers and the next year, like, because you're always a lag effect. Like, you're not, when you're scouting under sixes, you know, it takes two years for them to come through. Mm. But then the next under eight season, I got five players signed in one season. And that was, like, my record. And then, like, the year after that, four players. And, like, I've, I've been doing so well for, like, the players I've been recruiting since Chelsea have given me a bit more freedom as a scout and let th me do things my way, which is a bit different. Mm -hmm. So I really respect them and I'm so grateful for how they've helped me. And so, yeah, so I suppose because of the flexibility of Chelsea, it's it's allowed me to um, keep my role and keep producing players for them. Fantastic. So your your company is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, academy in, in the UK. Would you agree? I feel like for coach... The amount of players that we have, I I probably would guess so. Little Kickers, Little Kickers, they've just sold their company. Mm -hmm. When they sold, they had 72,000 players. Wow. And I think they sold for like $25 million from what I've been told. Wow. So they got incorporated under Soccer Shots. I don't know if you know that company. Yeah, yeah Soccer Shots. Yeah, Soccer Shots. And I think Soccer Shots have something like, 200,000 players or something crazy so uh yeah it's a, I, I do think like because our age group of kids is 4 to 12 that that is a different challenge compared to what little kickers might do which is 18 month year olds to 4 year olds as their main target group mm -hmm. but like I really respect what they've done what soccer shots have done and so, yeah, and in terms of that age group of four to 12, I think we are coaching the most kids. Yeah. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit, what, what is one key to, to, to your success with your business? Because a lot of coaches, when they start up in the first couple of years, that they'll go through a couple of challenges and then a lot of them quit because something's not working. But what was the key for you to, to build such a successful business? How, how did you keep going through the challenges you had? I would probably say in response to that answer, I'm thinking about it and probably being able to live on hardly any money. I think like where you're describing there, I see a lot with coaches and it's completely understandable because it's a super low paid industry. Yeah. So for, for many years, I would have been living on 20,000, 25,000. I, I don't know. I, I, I can't even think, but I just found a way to just live a cheap life, but keep keep being able to reinvest in the business, keep sticking with it, keep persevering. And I think when you keep persevering with something, if you are trying to be like 1% better every day and you're trying to improve, and like I was super fortunate that like my brother um, he alongside like the business that I've been growing with women footballers and I share it with my brother and this other person that I mentioned who got involved in 2015 but my my brother and I we we formed a company uh, doing like marketing like it was like it was creating websites back in 2009 2010 and that formed a little marketing agency and I think being exposed to that that made me not just think about the football coaching side of things, but also like the whole business. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I was very fortunate with that. We've we've invested a lot with technology. And so, yeah, so I suppose with, with all of this and just persevering with it, it it's now got, got the company to get some scale. Fantastic. 
So you talked about investing in yourself. So what what would be a few things or one thing that any coach watching wants to get to the level you are with your business? What's one thing that you would say to them? Do you know what? Invest into this because it's going to make you better or it'll help you to grow. I mean, like I'm not just saying it, but obviously it's taken me like 20 years to get to this kind of stage mm. but there has been so much pain before this 20 years so I don't know if I would advise to someone else to, to go through it and also it was a different time because yeah. when I was first starting out there wasn't as many commercial coaching businesses as mm. there are now obviously with things like Canva things like with with just you can set yourself up a company with Instagram quickly and you're you're immediately someone can become a one-to-one -one coach mm. and then they've got a business they've got a commercial coaching business and they're up and running and there's so many of those so you you know it's it's easier now to to do that mm -hmm. but I, I don't know if if it if it's advisable to try and take on to say all right yeah I want to have a company which is trying to have 20,000 students because are you prepared to go through so much black like, pain to get there mm. like, I, I don't know if, if everyone wants that because like, I, like I've had to make so many sacrifices you know I, I would love to have had a family I would have loved to like done a lot of things I have a lot more holidays like mm. you know been able to go shopping a lot more you know all these sort of things but you, you can't do that because your money is just going into your business or you're just having to live on a very low wage. You're not taking a lot out of the business. So I think people should be careful about that, what ambition they want. Uh, yeah, I, I would kind of, yeah, just say that. But in terms of like, you know, getting into coaching, I think, yeah, I mean, st study business, um, study what the best people are doing. Be careful not to be so focused on the product because we're all so passionate, we all love football, but I feel like that's a common mistake that can happen where people just stick into thinking about making their coaching sessions good, but they don't understand about how to develop themselves as a brand and how to get themselves out there. Mm -hmm. I love I love that piece of advice. Um, I love when, when I do these types of interviews with coaches because you get to see the actual journey that they went on. Because if you don't know someone you automatically think, right, 200 plus centers, everything's successful, but then you don't see the journey that that went into having those centers, expanding, uh, as you mentioned, living on very little money. Um, so it's it's great piece of advice. Now, when when it started to grow, why why did you decide on a franchise? Why why did that make sense to you? Yeah, that's a good question. And I can't really take credit for it. Uh, like I would say- You've been honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to be. Yeah, it's, it's so important to yeah be authentic. And th yeah. that's the only way that, yeah, you can help other people with these sorts of conversations. So yeah, like around 2013, 2014, like I kind of mentioned that we'd had a certain amount of success in London yeah. And at that point, I had quite a few like, employees, but th there's a girl who now plays in and around Chelsea first team women's and her name's Ashanti Akpan. She she was going to our Chiswick Centre and I'll never forget it. Like her mum rang me. Her mum was super helpful to getting me a lot of customers. And then she rang me and she said, Sean, you know what? The quality is dropping a little bit over at Chiswick. I'm down here. Like, I think this is not at the level and then my friend Marcelo, who ended up like having a franchise with us, he was like the main manager for that one. And I kind of was thinking, like, yeah, he's probably not quite as hungry anymore. I'm thinking like maybe, you know, he wasn't quite at it like he used to be. And he'd maybe suffered some burnout. Mm. But like I probably I wasn't paying him enough. I didn't really have that much money to give him. So he wasn't that incentivized. The quality's dropping a bit. And I felt like we kind of hit a ceiling a bit and and I was like pushing to say like where do we grow from here like how do we grow this and so 
I felt I had hit my sort of knowledge barrier mm. and I was like trying to read a lot of books and things like that, but still probably wasn't developing. And a lot of the books I was reading, everything was saying mentorship, mentorship. You've got to go and find someone who's where you want to be and then yeah. get mentorship from them and then they'll help guide you. So I, I took that advice. I went and seek mentorship. And to be fair, I had seek, got mentorship in the past and like no disrespect to that person, but they were just a parent who came to my football classes and they kind of told me, oh, I do consultancy. And then I then like took their advice hmm. And I was paying them like a very small amount of money, yeah. but then knowledge probably, I mean, it was, I, I'm I'm grateful to that person at that time, but, but I felt like at a certain point they hadn't achieved a lot. They hadn't sold a business for like millions of pounds or, you know, they hadn't got to that level that I was trying to get to. Yeah. So I went out and then I found through, through the other business, through the, Web, website business I was at like a trade show thing and there was these speakers and there was someone who was there who uh, it was called Rockstar Mentors they, they closed down now but th th the idea of this business was that to be a mentor for them you had to have sold a business for more than five million pounds yeah. and then they would then offer mentorship to you and a lot of these case studies that were coming through this business there was a lot of people who raised investment or, you know, you know, really like successful, good things that happened to their businesses after working with these mentors. So I reached out. It was so expensive. It was like £350 an hour. So it was like so much for me. But again, I was just so committed. I, I found a way. Um, the, the, they gave me a mentor. Like I said, this person, Ian Lancaster, who's got involved in the business, he done a few sessions with me and I think we both knew like as we were talking about the problems and he was helping I suppose he was testing me and my brother and we might have been testing him a little bit but yeah really got on well and then around Christmas time that year the end of 2014 like he said to us look rather than paying me free 700 quid for like two hours rather than keep paying me this money for this consultancy why don't I do a day a month for you? And then I'll take a stake in the business. Um, I think you should franchise this business. And for me, I thought he was nuts because, <laughs> and in that time, it's that thing that people talk about where you can't see through the forest. And to me, I, I had a lot of spinning plates, I had a load of things going on. I was, I was just trying to make sure I was keeping on top of all the chaos had the other website company there's so much going on and I was trying to do an app with Jamie Redknapp and and I believed a lot more in my app than I actually did with the physical football coaching business because mm -hmm. again a lot of the stuff that's coming from the internet around that time was oh you you shouldn't scale stuff bricks and mortar you've got to scale online that's the only way that you'll be able to yeah. reach your goals that sort of thing and I was really believing a lot of that mm -hmm. so then but but I pursued it, but I sort of still went with it. And he was, he just, he saw into the future. He said, right, we need to change the name. Like our company back then was called Sports Links. So he said, scrap that. He said, we make footballers. Cause that was our tagline that was on our shirts. So he said, use that name and we'll franchise it and we'll do this and we'll do this. And he literally just gave all the answers. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I, for me, I was just working hard the same way that, when I would have been trying to be a football player, once you know your training, you mm. do the training that you're asked to do. You don't have to think yeah. and you just work super hard. And that's what I did. And then, yeah, we started getting, you know, results over the years. It's amazing. Would you, would you say that had you not met that person, the company wouldn't be where it is now? That's a really good question. That's a rare. I've really, been asked that before. I'll put, I'll put you on the spot a little bit there. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a good one. Like, it's hard to say because maybe if we we're so desire, we me and my brother have had such desire mm. to want to make this happen, and I feel like we are pro solving problems that need to be solved. Yeah. So potentially, we still would have met someone else 
who would have given us that direction and you know he that that guy didn't invent franchising yeah but but i don't know you know you don't know and i i'm extremely grateful i'll be forever grateful to ian for yeah at that time you know bringing through us through that part of the journey fantastic so for for coaches watching because i do get asked um a lot of questions and this is something i told you off air uh, a lot of coaches reach out and say leo i wanna i wanna buy a franchise or i want to invest in a franchise so for you tell us a little bit about the difference with starting your own thing or investing into a franchise what are the pros and cons of both yeah, so I often think in my mind, like if I was 21 and I came into We Make Footballers and I could buy the franchise, I think I would do that. And it would just give me the answers. It would it would save me so much of the pain that I've had to do in building websites, building brands, getting legal documents, finding processes for DBS checks coming up with a coaching philosophy coming up with courses on how to train up coaches how to recruit coaches how to work out the perfect digital marketing strategy just there's just so so much and like we're in terms of you know once you do get a business to a certain size you need you know you need a team around you so like if you're going to build a full-time head office staff then yeah that costs a good amount of money so that, that that's why the franchise system does work well because it becomes very much like win-win. So the franchisee for women footballers is going to pay 11.1% of their turnover. And that's probably roughly what you would pay for a back office team. But you're not having to manage it. You're not having to recruit it. And we really make sure that our team are giving that much value to make sure that people are succeeding or getting in enough inquiries getting enough new leads that the brand is always growing and developing we're always creating new social media content we're always like innovating the product so yeah i feel that it does become very much like win-win but obviously you know some people if they've got a certain background in coaching then you know they, they can do it themselves i feel like the majority of our competitors like at the start when you're talking about maybe the size of our company and, and who our competitors are part of the reason why I was saying that you don't get very many other four to 12 year old companies is because it's so hard to franchise this type of business and scale it. And it's so hard for coaches to be able to remove themselves from th their business. Like, because normally what will happen is that it's a talented coach. They're really likable. They're good at coaching they start in their local area. The parents all gravitate to them. The kids gravitate to them. They put on good sessions. But then that coach, after how many years, starts to get burnout. And then they then try to remove themselves from the session. Or maybe they start not going to as many or go on holiday or whatever it might be. And if they haven't got the processes in place to, to replace themselves, then that's where things start to falter. Yeah. And that's that's a lot of what i do see as this that's common in the industry mm -hmm. uh, so yeah i mean franchising isn't right for like everyone but there are there are people who are being so successful with our business and yeah when you when you get the right people who do it um yeah it, it can really really work for both parties nice now, would you agree that whichever avenue you take, whether it be buying one of your franchise or starting by yourself, eh, would you agree that you still have to have the business skills as well as being a great coach? Because a lot of coaches think that, right, because they're a good coach, they're going to be successful business owners. But it doesn't work that way, in my opinion. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. And... That's why with the franchising, we recognize that the, the whole thing is it's a business in a box. Yeah. So we give them the tools. So the same way that back in 2015, that guy gave me all the things that I needed to do to build out a franchise business, like gave them the answer, gave me the answers. So that's what 
we do you know if, if you were buying a successful pizza franchise you would want to know what ingredients to put in the pizza and how long it's got to cook for and how to train up those staff all those things mm. a good franchise is going to give you those answers so I, I feel like a person to make it a success if they're going into a franchise business they have to be very very hard working they have to be able to comply and apply themselves to instruction and learn and be willing to learn and I guess they've got to be able to be a good leader of people because you need to be able to deal with your suppliers that might be with the schools with the venues that you hire you can't be a difficult person to work with or you're going to lose that venue and then the same with em employing or like engaging with contractors uh, having having coaches that are working with you they have to like you they have to want to be with you mm. so that's important like you know it's not just because someone wants to buy a franchise with we make footballers that we give it to them there's a very very strong vetting process mm. and the best franchises that's what they do but the things that we look for are, yeah, mainly like the people skills and the hard work and desire to succeed. Fantastic. So, Sean, what, where, where do you see the uh, youth football industry going in the next five years? Um, yeah, I, I like that question. That's a cool question to ask. Um, so, I think, like, I think it's relative to the country. I think the I'm excited by America. I'm I'm actually personally looking to move to America because I really want to be involved in the changes that are happening. I feel like America would not I'm not saying this in like a disrespectful way, but maybe it's kind of like five years, seven years behind where England was from a youth coaching perspective. Like I, I remember England 2007 when we didn't qualify for the Euros. And we were just rock bottom. I always talk about it. And I felt like we were rock bottom at a national level, but also at a grassroots level as well. And I've seen like the amazing work that so many people have done, including Premier League, FA, all the academies, but mainly at a grassroots level, all the changes that have happened that have been so positive with so many coaches like educating themselves and improving themselves. And I feel like that culture to be so strong has led to all the success in our national team and the players that we've developed who are English players um, playing at, you know, Premier League, Champions League. And so, yeah, I feel like there's no reason why America couldn't do that. So mm. I feel that there'll be, they'll, that, that'll be some big improvements that happen there. And I think they'll end up being a real force. I think there'll be a continual, like sharing of information that is is happening that I see as a real positive trend with with countries sharing their videos of their players and their methodologies. I think with with um yeah like with Guardiola, you see how he's obviously changed the way that football is done at the highest level, mm. very much like possession based. So that's obviously come through to youth development now and the way that we develop our players. The thing is that there's a probably I'm seeing it online where there's a big resistance to that. There's a lot of people that don't like that type of football and they miss the sort of like freedom, the chaos of the old, like open football. And maybe there'll be some sort of like shift. Maybe there'll be such a resistance and maybe Guardiola will finish football and then football will kind of go back to a bit more sort of chaotic style. And then that will then come through in our coaching again. I, I don't know. But yeah, that's kind of my my reaction to your question. Fantastic. Perfect. All right. Well, Sean, I want to uh, want to first thank you for coming on, sharing your story uh, with us. I know for a while I've been meaning to try and get you on. So I'm really happy to, to have you here. Uh, good luck with the growth of We Make uh, Footballers. Thank you. And I hope to maybe in a year's time bring you back on and we can we can catch up from where we left off and see how you've been killing it in the us as well <laughs> oh, no, i appreciate it thank you so much Leonardo. i really appreciate it no problem thank you sean cheers mate